Now, as the name of the video implies, this is the seventh part of a story, so links to the previous six parts will be in the description below if you either need to catch up or want to check out the first part to see if this is something you might enjoy and want to work your way back here for this part. For everyone else, without further ado, let's get back to the story. We start by getting a shot of a young girl, maybe around the age of eight or so, with long red hair and she's sitting cross-legged with her eyes closed in a dimly lit room aboard perhaps a large starship. All around her float objects of various shapes and sizes, everything from data pads to crates and containers to other small odds and ends. And as we continue to watch her, her focus does not waver in the slightest, nor do any of the floating objects flutter at all until we hear the sound of a nearby door slide open, which is when we see her face twitch ever so slightly. A moment later then, we hear the sounds of heavy footsteps approaching her, along with the sound of mechanical breathing. And as the footsteps draw closer and the breathing gets ever louder, we see the young girl's face twitch again, and soon enough, she begins to tremble ever so slightly. The objects floating around her, which had hung in the air completely motionless, are also beginning to quiver and shake. And as the moments go by, we can tell by the ever-increasing look of panic upon her face that it is getting harder and harder to concentrate and maintain her hold on all the items around her. And once the footsteps have come to a stop, we can now see Darth Vader standing just outside the circle of floating objects. That's when the young girl loses her hold on a small metal object, perhaps a tiny screw of some kind. And we watch and then hear it clank to the floor. It is then that everything seems to go still and silent for a very long moment, until we hear the sound of Vader's lightsaber igniting, and we watch him as he draws it back and swings it in the direction of the young girl, who does nothing more than shut her eyes even tighter and seem to brace herself for what is to come. We then watch as all the items begin to tumble to the floor, released by the young girl, and see Vader's saber slice through some of them as the crimson red blade gets so close to the girl's face that, for just a second, we think she must have just been decapitated. But then, the girl's eyes flare open, and she raises a hand to her cheek that has a slight singe mark upon it. She then moves her hand to her hair, and we see that some of it has been burnt or hacked away by the lightsaber. And that's when her gaze turns upwards, and to Vader. And at him, she glares with eyes full of anger as frustrated tears begin to well up in her eyes. That's when Vader says down to her, Yes, my young apprentice, you must learn to turn your fear into anger. Only through hatred will you begin to realize the full power of the dark side. The young girl then springs to her feet, and we see her little hands ball up into fists as she stares up at Vader and vows, I'm going to kill you someday. Vader then regards her quietly for a few seconds before only saying, Perhaps. He then turns and starts to head back towards the door, and as he does he says, Fear is a weapon, my apprentice, one you either wield or have used against you. Decide which it shall be for you. As soon as Vader is gone and the door slides shut behind him, the young girl all but collapses to the floor and begins to sob. A few seconds later, though we do not hear the door open again, we hear another voice, a kind voice, and it says to her, Erba, my child, tears will never solve your problems. Immediately then, Erba raises her head and uses the backs of her hands to begin to wipe away the tears. She then looks upon and smiles at Anakin Skywalker, who at this time appears to be around the age of 70. She then springs back up to her feet and begins to run at him with arms open, as if she's going to try and embrace him. But Anakin quickly raises a hand and shakes his head and says, No, no, child. Remember to look inward for your strength. Finding comfort in others will only make you weak in the end. Erba then stops just short of him, a few paces away, and though she doesn't necessarily seem to like that answer, she nods her head in agreement and says, I understand, Grandfather. Being called that seems to catch Anakin off guard, and he says, crouching down to her level and looking into her eyes, why did you just call me that? Erba gives a big exaggerated shrug and replies, I don't know, it just felt right, I guess. Anakin then says back, you must never call me that again, do you understand? Erba seems very confused, then nods and says, seemingly forgetting the whole thing, I've been working on something, would you like to see it? Anakin nods eagerly and stands back up straight as she runs off and grabs something from the fallen circle of items. When she returns, she hands up to him a mask that he only looks at but does not take. Anakin then says, very impressive work my child, you seem to have some skill for tinkering and creating things. 
Airbus smiles and nods at the compliment and says, it's not finished yet, but when it is, it'll be scarier than his, and people will look at me and be afraid the same way they're afraid of him. Anakin nods, still looking at the mask as he says, it's already quite terrifying to behold, my child. Airbus' smile grows when she hears that, and she says, want to help me work on it? But Anakin quickly shakes his head and says with genuine sadness upon his face, you know I can't stay long. We've discussed this before. And with those words, Airbus' smile vanishes, and she hangs her head a bit and she mutters, I understand. Anakin then reaches out a hand towards her, as if he's going to comfort her, but stops himself when he realizes what he was about to do, and a look of anger even passes by his face, one that young Erba doesn't see. He then says to her, Now go on, child, back to practicing. You just vowed to a Sith Lord you were going to destroy him someday, and that's never going to happen unless you become what you were meant to be. With a solemn look upon her face, Erba nods to that and, mask in hand, runs back towards the circle of objects, and when she's in the middle of them, she turns around and looks to where Anakin just was, but he's now gone. She gives a faint smile and says softly, Bye, Grandfather, before plopping herself down and putting on the crude, unfinished mask that she will one day wear as Darth Eisen. Moments later then, all the objects begin to float around her once more. We then switch scenes and find ourselves on Jakku and see the small, run-down dwelling that belongs to Rey, before we're taken inside and see Ben sitting on the edge of the bed, still very much banged up from his crash landing. We then watch as Rey hands him a wooden bowl full of some type of grayish stew, at which Ben looks at with disgust. Rey notices the look and says, Sorry, if I knew a famous senator was going to be dropping by, I would have prepared something better. Ben frowns when he hears that and says, I'm not a famous senator. Not hardly. My parents, they're famous. But not me. Ben ends by shaking his head and then taking a bite of the stew, which, by his reaction, he's surprised to find out isn't half bad. He then says, where do you even find food on this planet? Ray gives a bit of a shrug and says, I trade the excess water from my evaporators for food. You'd be amazed how many other species live on this planet. Ben gives a feigned look of fascination and takes another bite of his stew, and that's when they both look at each other and freeze as they hear a ship apparently fly close overhead, so close that it basically just buzzed the small dwelling. With a grimace and a groan of pain then, Ben gets to his feet and runs outside as quickly as his injured body will allow, and just in time to get a glimpse of Darth Ison's ship as it flies up and away and high into the atmosphere, apparently leaving them without firing. Ray, now standing behind Ben and looking up and seeing the ship that is now just little more than a dark speck in an endless sky of blue, says, Was that a friend of yours? Not exactly, Ben says back before continuing. We have to get out of here. The Republic needs to know the Empire still exists. He then turns, looks at Ray and says, There has to be a way off this planet. Ray gives him a helpless shake of the head and replies, If there was a way off this planet, I would have taken it years ago. Ben thinks for a moment, then says, you said there was an Imperial base nearby, the one your parents worked at. Certainly they have ships. Ray gives him a look like he's an idiot, and then says, of course they have ships. To that, Ben says, we could break into the base and steal one. Again, Ray looks at him like he's an idiot, but says nothing this time. Ben then says, do you have a better idea? To which Ray nods and simply says, yeah, not doing that. Ben frowns and then says, you used to live there, right? At the base, I mean. Do you remember the layout at all? To that, Ray says, and if we steal a ship, you're going to fly us out of here. Ben nods to that, and Ray points off into the distance where a thin trail of smoke can still be seen rising from where Ben crashed the Imperial shuttle he left Vader's Star Destroyer on. What makes you think I'd trust you to do that, is all Ray then says. Ben gives a bit of a cocky grin and says, I learned how to fly from my father. Trust me, we make it into a ship that isn't sabotaged, and I'll get us off this planet and far away from here. We then switch scenes and get a shot of Darth Eisen's ship as it lands in one of the hangar bays of Darth Vader's Super Star Destroyer. A moment later, we're with Darth Eisen, helmet off, as she storms down the corridor that leads to Darth Vader's chambers, her eyes blazing yellow and a look of pure rage upon her face. And as she draws ever closer, the two guards on duty pull pikes from out of their red robes and cross them in front of the double doors. Immediately then in response, Darth Eisen extends both her hands out and catches the guards in force chokes. She then raises her arms and subsequently raises the guards off their feet. Finally, she forms a fist with both hands, and at the same instant, we hear the necks of the guards snap, and their bodies go limp before she just lets them drop to the floor. 
When she then reaches the doors, they do not open, and so she places her palm flat against one of them, and within seconds, the door begins to vibrate, slowly at first and then rather violently, before finally being ripped off and pushed back into the chamber. And as she marches in, her hand now falling to her side where her lightsaber hangs, she sees that in the center of the room, as usual, is Darth Vader. And, also as usual, his helmet is off, revealing an ancient, decaying face, and only his mouth and nose are covered by some type of respirator-like device. Hovering before him and capturing all of his attention is once again the small stone, and it is giving off a golden glow and showing him an image of a duel that took place so many years ago on Mustafar between himself and Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's when Darth Eisen says, Your obsession with that stone, with changing the past, is pathetic. No Sith looks backwards when the future already belongs to them. You need only find the Hall Crown of Plagueis to unlock the secrets of cheating death he discovered, and you would rule this galaxy unchallenged for an age. We then watch as Vader takes his hand and snatches the stone out of the air, bringing an end to the golden glow and the image contained within it. He then, with clearly a great deal of effort, pushes himself up and out of the chair-like apparatus he is in, and stands in silence over Darth Eisen, who now looks up at him with almost a look of awe upon her face. Vader then says, The constant pain caused by this suit has given me great strength, but at the same time limited what I could become. My old master knew this, and knew if I ever found a way to free myself, he would not be able to control me, that I would destroy him. That is why he hid the Holocron of Plagueis. Darth Eisen then, almost involuntarily it seems, falls to a knee and lowers her head and says, I know this, my master, which is why you must allow me to continue to search for it, instead of wasting precious time having me deal with Ben Solo while you seek a way to change the past. Vader then replies, And what is it you think I wish to change about the past, my apprentice? We now see hesitation and doubt on Darth Eisen's face, and she says nothing. Finally, Vader commands her to speak, and so she does. I, I've always felt it, my master, way down deep. Regret. When I was young, and you came to me as your old self, as Anakin Skywalker, I always somehow knew it was a trick of sorts, a, a way to push me closer to the darkness, disguised as compassion. And yet, there was something more to it than that. Darth Eisen looks up then, and we can see tears welling up in her eyes as she says, I'm not all that you hoped I would become. I know that. I know why you want Ben Solo to replace me at your side. Yet I also know you can't bring yourself to destroy me. It is then that Darth Vader extends a hand back towards his chair-like apparatus and pulls to him his lightsaber that had been resting there. And as he ignites it, just like when she was a child, we watch as Erebus Skywalker shuts her eyes and braces herself as Vader swings the saber at her. And just as we see Erba's eyes flare open, the reflection of Vader's red saber within them, we immediately switch scenes and watch as the eyes of Luke Skywalker, somewhere on the other side of the galaxy, also flare open, and the look on his face is the look of a man who is experiencing a tremendous amount of pain, and we watch as he doubles over from the kneeling position he was in. And we now see that he is of course in the Sith Temple on Malachor, and kneeling next to him was the ancient female Sith. And to Luke she says, what trick is this now, Skywalker? You promised to show me forbidden knowledge, to lay bare the path of immortality. And if you do not fulfill your promise, I shall not hesitate in destroying you. To that, Luke says nothing. And as the pain seems to subside for the most part, and he gets his wits about him again, we see a look of some kind of realization come across Luke's face. He then shuts his eyes tight and shakes his head regretfully and mutters, What am I becoming? Mara, I'm sorry. I feel it now. Luke then quickly gets to his feet, stands before the ancient Sith and declares, I will teach you nothing. Vader must be stopped, yes, but I cannot do that by embracing the darkness, but only by eclipsing it with the light. That's when the ancient Sith lets out a long cackling laugh before saying, Finally you begin to understand what it truly means to be a Jedi. But too late, I think, for if you will not share the knowledge with me, I shall just rip it from your mind. And with blinding speed then, the ancient Sith hops to her feet and reaches out and presses her palm to Luke's forehead as she begins to cackle gleefully once more. 
That's when the scene shifts, and we're taken just outside the temple and watch as a forlorn-looking Ahsoka Tano slowly heads towards the small Jedi shuttle. At one point, when she's almost reached the shuttle, she halts, looks back over her shoulder at the temple, and only sighs before turning back around and looking down at her feet, where she sees a puddle. And within that puddle, she stares at her own reflection. And while staring at it, she taps a button on a small device on her belt, and the ramp to the ship begins to lower, causing the ground to tremble for just a moment and a ripple in the puddle to distort her reflection. When the water is still once more, Ahsoka no longer sees a reflection of the way she appears now, but rather of how she looked when she was young and had just become a Padawan. Standing next to her in this reflection, she also sees the image of her old master, Anakin Skywalker, as he was back then. And to him she says, I'm sorry, Anakin. It seems I failed him too. Ahsoka then steps over the puddle and walks to and up the ramp and into the shuttle. A moment later, we're in the cockpit with her, and she immediately spots a flashing red light on the ship's console. When she hits a button, a recorded blue holographic image of Luke's apprentice, Varad, appears and immediately says, Master Skywalker, I regret to inform you that it seems Senator Ben Solo has been abducted, and though I have informed her you are unreachable, Senator Leia Organa implores me to do all I can to make contact with you so that you can perhaps aid in finding her son. At this point, Vered hangs his head and says, I, I'm sorry, Master. I, I don't know what to do or how to help her. I've told her that the Jedi Order is at her disposal and that we will do all we can to find her son. And Master Sindula has even launched a full investigation. But I don't personally know what to do to help. And at this point, it seems like Vered wants to say more but instead, the message just abruptly ends. That's when we focus in on the face of Ahsoka, and she says to herself as she looks out the window and towards the Sith Temple Luke is in, Vader must have learned the truth about Leia, a truth you were reluctant to even tell me about. But how? How did he figure it out? Ahsoka shakes her head to that, as if it really doesn't matter how, and then begins to punch some buttons and the ship's engines roar to life. That's when she says, well, all I know is he is one Skywalker. I will not fail. And that is where this part ends. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to tell me what you thought of this part of the story and what you think might happen next. So leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.